Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. We have a very special guest today for the first time on the channel. We have Zachary King, former High Wizard. What does that mean? Well, we're going to be getting right into good detail. Many people already are aware of Zachary's in high demand right now across social media, given his testimony. Uh, for his former life and his new life in the Lord. And first of all, I just want to say welcome, Zachary, and thank you very much for coming on to my humble abode and giving us your precious time. Thank you for inviting me. No, the pleasure is mine. Thank you. Uh, so, Zachary, I've watched only a couple of interviews with you so far. Very recently, in fact, a friend of mine in Scotland shared the video, the interview you had with Father Leo, I think it was the Friars of the Immaculate, and yes. that was very insightful indeed to say. I've never known a testament to give such a journey. And then I've watched you on another channel with a few other bits popping in. So I always try and, I know it can be repetitive at times, but we're always looking for something new or a different angle or follow-up questions to something that people have asked. So I do have a few structured questions, and I dare say most of it will come with the flow. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward, to, first of all, to give us the testimony as what does the High Wizard mean? What was it you get involved in? And why should people be listening to what you have to say, if we could start with that? Um, if you look at the hierarchy of what most people think, most people think the top position and a satanic coven is the high priest or the high priestess. But because if you started a coven and no one would follow what you say, you could be in a coven of one, and that would make you the high priest. When you come to my coven, a World Church of Satan, we would ask you, what, what was your position in your coven? Well, you could say you were the high priest for the last 30 years. We don't ask you how old you are. We don't know how old you are. We don't know how big your coven was. We can't verify it. So you say you are a high priest. So you have no power in our coven. High priest or high priestess might be like a general in their own coven. In our coven, you'd be like private. There's hundreds of you, and none of you can prove that you were, if you had any power. Now, we can test you with magical abilities, and you might have some magical abilities, but that doesn't mean that you're very high ranked still. In the World Church of Satan, a high priest or high priestess would be like, if you look at the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, the high priest or high priestess would be like a sacristan or a lectern. Mm -hmm. They basically have no power. Um, a high wizard is equal to a cardinal, but a cardinal that can never be pope. So you can be in the position just above the top position. When you're the, you're the high priest or you're the, the high wizard, the next person above you is the CEO or the board of directors. And if you moved into one of those two positions, those are the top positions. But being a high wizard, you can't be the CEO and you can't be on the board of directors. So you're as high as you can go. Right. You know, they have to, if they're voting on something and they hit a stalemate, they call you in to break the stalemate. You decide which, which way you want to go. And there's no repercussions. I mean, if you don't go with the CEO and you go with the board of directors and you go with their side, then the CEO can't do anything to you. This as well, if you go with the CEO and the board of directors get mad at you, they can't go against you. They can't, by the, the way the legalities are set up, you know, and the, the paperwork is done, there's no ill intent that goes towards the high wizard. There's no bad decisions can be made against. So all three are pretty much protected from each other, from anything going wrong. Um, the, I was, 
by, by the time I made High Wizard, I made High Wizard at age 21, but I'd been in magic since I was 10 years old. In my first coven, it was an OD, OTO coven, or I Templi Orianti, and it was also a Diablo Sax coven. Both of my covens were Diablo Sax. Uh, covens that, are, that embrace the name Diablo Sax are involved in human trafficking, child prostitution, and child pornography. And these, um, you know, t- by, by the time I was 10 years old, I had seen every scary movie that existed, everything I could get my hands on. And I just, I had a burning desire to find out if magic worked. Is magic real? Is that magic something somebody could really do? And I went to my Baptist preacher and my parents, and I said, is magic real? Can I really do this? You know, and they said, no, that magic was false. It was fake. It was something that was on television or in movies, but it doesn't exist in real life. And apparently my um, my parents and my Baptist preacher didn't read the 33 verses in the Bible that tell you not to do magic. You know, in the Old Testament, you're stoned to death. In the New Testament, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. You know, it's like, if it was impossible to lie, thou shalt not lie would, wouldn't be on the Ten Commandments. If it was impossible to kill somebody, thou shalt not kill wouldn't be in the Ten Commandments. But thou shalt not lie is said one time. Yet it's important enough to be in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill is mentioned one time, but it's important enough to put it in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal is mentioned one time, but it's important enough to put it in the Ten Commandments. Don't do magical things is said 33 times. It seems like that would be mildly important. If he's telling us 33 times, then it must be possible to do magic things for him to tell us 33 times not to do them. Now, I had a guy say last year that he would give me $10,000 if I could prove magic was real. So I had him come over to my house and I pulled up the 33 verses. And I said, thou shalt not steal is important, but it's only said once. You know, it's like, this is mentioned 33 times in the Bible. This proves magic is real, because if it wasn't real, he wouldn't said it 33 times. And uh, I'm still waiting for my $10,000. <laughs> it's yeah, a pretty significant him. number as well, isn't it? Without getting off on a tangent. I'm just thinking 33 right. of Christ, 33 levels of masonry, I think, or something like that. Or And something, right. the other one I realized, I saw a quick video where Tom Cruise in his movies, 33 seems to appear all the time. Yeah, I don't know if you've been aware of that. Someone noticed a video and put it all together. But anyway, that's something else. But I, I thought it was in the Bible. 33. It, was quite, it makes you wonder why 33, because nothing's by accident when it comes to God and right. uh, Revelation. <laughs> uh, I mean, at Disney World and Disneyland, there's the 33 Club. Ah, see, we could go off on that, but uh, maybe we could in a little bit then, uh, Zachary, but I'm just thinking, I mean, that's a very young age in your 20s to become... Not just any level, but, I mean, you're talking right at the top, high wizard. Well, What's got, the journey from 10 years of age to being right at the top? How does that happen in such a quick time? Well, I loved magic. I was consumed by magic. I, I set about to prove that magic either works or it doesn't. And I thought, what kind of spell could I do that would prove that? Now... I don't like the pop quiz I get every Friday, but I know if I break my teacher's leg and she's out of class, I'll replace her with another teacher that might be worse. I also know that I don't like, I'm a fat little kid, nerdy kid. I don't like PE class either, but I know that if I get rid of my coach, they'll replace him with another coach and that coach could be worse. 
So, but what if I did a spell for cash? Somebody loses some cash. I find some cash. That person will get over it. They'll find some more cash. I'll be able to buy some stuff. You know, the, the three things that were the most important to me were comic books. They were 15 to 20 cents. Candy bars, they were 15 to 20 cents. And penny candy was a penny. So for a dollar, I could get 100 pieces. Mm -hmm. My dad would pay the 4% sales tax, and I would get a full 100 pieces for just a dollar. I mean, this is, this is a good deal to me. So I did a spell for money. And the next day I went out playing, I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. Five, the tennis balls kind of wasted. I don't need those. But $5, that's 500 pieces of candy. <laughs> this, is a, this is a score. But this could have been a coincidence. Somebody had to find that can. It just happened to be me. So the next weekend, I did it again. Saturday, I went out and go play, and I found a $10 bill on the side of the road. That's a 1,000 pieces of candy. This is pretty good, but this still could have been a coincidence because there was a bunch of people on that road that day. I just happened to look down and see it. So then I'm the next weekend. Now, see, when we were at school, uh, the first day of the fifth grade, this kid came up to me and said, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. Well, the first break is at 1020. And there's no warnings back then about if somebody invites you to go in the bathroom, don't go. Nobody said that. And we're in school. What could possibly happen? What could go wrong? So I go in the bathroom. There's 49 other kids there. And they said, we're going to turn out the lights, chant a phrase a certain number of times. And if we do it right, the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror. Well, that doesn't sound plausible. It doesn't sound like if I chanted something, anything is going to show up in the mirror. You know how many times have I been in the bathroom and there's never anybody in the mirror but me? But, you know, they turned out all the lights. Now, some of the kids are still scared of the dark at being 10 years old. And there's a little apprehension going on in the room. But we start chanting the Bloody Mary phrase. And after we did it 11 times, we saw this scary face in the mirror. And 49 kids ran screaming from the bathroom. One child, he's an idiot. I can call him an idiot because it was me. Stayed in the bathroom thinking, I did this. I chanted the phrase X number of times. All the other kids left the bathroom. I'm still in here. It knows I got him in here. And I thought this was the coolest thing ever. Now, I remember at 10 years old, you're not as smart as you should be. You're not as smart as you think you are. <clears throat> This face in the mirror is not some distant land really far away. It's not even the room behind the mirror. If you're seeing it in the mirror, it's standing next to you. You're seeing the reflection of the demon. Yeah, it's not a burn victim, it's a demon. And it's not a game, it's a spell. And did you play it when you were in school? Me, no, but you've brought up a memory that I've long forgotten. A couple of memories, actually. I remember one time I was, we call it primary school, you know, between 5 and 12 before you go to high school. I must have been about 10, 11, and there was, a, the, there was about two years above me uh, before they went to high school, and there was a group of girls that had done something like that with the mirror in the toilet, and the teachers were outside talking to them because they were crying. They were a bit in hysterics and things like that. And, of course, the whisper and get back. Um, that was in the mid-90s. I remember, I remember something like that. I think one of the girls who instigated all that, um, a few years later at high school and college, you see that she's became a goth and things like that, dressed in black all the time. And that comes with its own kind of, 
reputation with saying right. this stuff and all that. And then I think uh, she came to mind not so long ago, a couple of years ago. I don't know why. I think she appeared in a dream, actually. I, I mean, I haven't seen this this girl since school, like 20 plus years at least. And usually when I get someone appearing in my dream like that, it's like maybe say a prayer for them. So I've probably cut a year or two ago, she out of nowhere. I don't have her on social media or anything, come to think of it. She just appeared in my um, my dream. So I did look her up to see if she was about. Didn't send any friend requests or anything. But she was now, I mean, looking at her photos, she was into dominatrix stuff for hire. She's dressing up like nuns and all that pornography looking stuff. She Whatever she gets hired to do for parties. So she, from that time of that thing with the mirror at primary school, seen her through high school and college with the gothic stuff and then hanging out in the cities where it was centralised at the weekends. You could get into the city centre and you'd see where they'd all be gathering, dressed in black. But then all these years later, as a grown woman, I think probably at 40 now. So uh, to answer that question, that's what just came to memory as I'm listening to you. Um, but back then the kids were in hysterics I knew from a very young age never to dabble in that I was brought up in the Catholic faith not about spiritual warfare or anything my dad made us know the Bible stories although we could never know where it was in the Bible uh, he was a great devotee of St. Padre Pio and we knew many stories of him and I was an altar boy but there was one time even I'll, I'll maybe bring this in now since you've asked a couple of, about that a friend of mine, again, teenage years, started looking and experimenting and all that. One time she wrote my name on a purple ribbon and put it in the freezer. And she was getting into wicker or something. And, and without knowing anything of all that, just being a cradle Catholic boy, I, I was like, I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. And I went home and I prayed. And it was instinct, not knowledge. It was instinct and prayed protection to Our Lady and things. I have no idea to this day what it was all about, but she she was looking in at Wicca and all that stuff. But um, it, I, I don't know what you think of that. What's that? She was trying to make you fall in love with her. Oh, she never needed the ribbon for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was uh, she was she was one of my best friends growing up at high school. But a couple of times we we may have went out, so to say. But in the end, when we were talking young age, but. Um, we just remained friends for a long time after it and whatever, but uh, I, I don't know what it was. She never explained it. She says something to do about protection. I says, well, I don't need protection from a ribbon. I've got Jesus and Mary, <laughs> you know. Um, but, yeah, that's the kind of things I saw, but I never dabbled in anything like that. I think instinctively I always stuck with Jesus, you know. I was in uh, New Zealand. I did a tour in New Zealand in 2016 so i spoke like eight times in auckland and another six times in christchurch and in some other town for three or four times and so one of the places i spoke was at a catholic um boys college and the teachers said we're familiar with your story don't say anything about the bloody mary game because they won't know it and it'll scare them I said, well, if you don't want me to say it, you need to pray to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to not say it because the Holy Spirit leads the talk. I said, but I think you're going to be surprised what your kids know. And so I'm I'm doing my talk, and we went right into the, the Bloody Mary game. And I asked, how many kids here have heard of the Bloody Mary game? And all the hands went up. And you heard the professors were sitting on the far side of the gym and you could hear them gasp. They couldn't believe their students had heard of it. And I said, how many of you have played it? And it looked like all the hands went up. And I said, well, maybe we can do this a better way. Could the student put his hand up that has not played it? And all the hands came down and no hands went up. So I said, it's safe to say all of you have played the game? And they all said, yes. You know, and I asked them, where did they learn the game? And they all learned the game, all of them, 
without without one of them saying differently, all of them learned it at their previous church. What the in, church? The in the church in the bathroom. <laughs> and the church, church was also a school, so it could have been during the school, but it was in this church building. Right. They all learned the Bloody Mary game. And when the talk was over and the Q&A was over, the professors talked to me and said they had no idea. And said, I told you, your kids always know more than what you think they do. Yeah, true. If, if we, with that all being said, and that's how it began with you then, Zachary, what happened next? How did it become networking? How did it become a group, a coven? And how did you start climbing the ladder, so to say? How did that all come about? There was a kid that played D&D with us. And I played D&D during this time. And I, do, I was doing campaigns every weekend of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And then he left us. He stopped going to school. He stopped going to church. And we just thought he moved away. When I was 11 years old, I became the survivor of a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher. And she told me that it was my idea. I wanted to do it. And if I told anybody, I would be arrested. I would go to prison. I would be expelled from school. And my parents would disown me. And when I got out of prison, she made it sound like this would all happen in one year. When I got out of prison, and I would only be 12 years old or you know 11 years old, um, that I would have to get a job and support myself because my parents wouldn't let me live, move back home. And so, you know, she's like, you better not tell anybody. You know, so I thought, well, obviously she's not going to lie to me. She's a teacher. So, you know, I just dove further into magic because that gave me comfort and solace. Mm. When I was 12 years old, this kid came back and said that, he plays D and D every weekend with a group that believes magic is real. Well, I know magic is real, so I think I'm going to go check these guys out. And I asked this guy, "Hey, man, where did you move to?" He didn't move. It, he was now trained to be a satanic recruiter. Now, he didn't say that, but that's what he was doing. He came back to get as many kids as he could to join this group, and he was homeschooled he went to church at home they had their own church to go to and, you know being protestant they're allowed to do that and you know it was just different than everything i'm used to hearing and so i go back and i, I check these guys out at my house i'm allowed to watch g-rated movies so we watch a lot of disney you know bed knobs and broomsticks became my favorite movie and you know, you can watch a PG-rated movie if it had been vetted by my dad first. That's the worst movie I could see was PG. But over at this other house, we found out there were rated R movies. There are X-rated movies. There are triple X-rated movies. And there's triple X-rated movies with kids in it my age. There's also magazines that have kids in it my age naked. And there's just still photos of kids my age, sometimes younger, sometimes older, but they're all naked. And they asked me, would I like to be in movies? Yes. You know, and they're like, we know that what happened to you was 11 years old, it's horrible, and that should have never happened to anybody. But now's your chance to get your power back. We don't have power, by the way. But now I can do these movies anytime I want. I can turn anybody down that I want to. Nobody can turn me down. Well, I wasn't into the nobody can turn me down thing because I knew what it was like to have something like that forced on you, and it's not pleasant. So I wouldn't do that part of it, but I would be in the movies. And so I met with three sisters. They were aged 8, 11, and 14. And all of them had been in child pornography since they were three. And each one taught me how to have sex. They said when I graduated the 14-year-old, then I'd be ready to be in movies. So it took me less than the summer 
a training with them. And then I, I got to be in porno and I got to be in it for four and a half years. Now, when I was in it, I thought I was the luckiest kid in the world. And I get to have sex with all these beautiful girls. And I'm having a great time. And I'm on film. And my films are being watched by kids all over the world. It was after I got out of it that I realized that it wasn't kids watching me. It was perverted adults watching me. You know, we would have, I don't know if you remember, in, in the United States, in the first and second grade, we had our own notebook paper. It was uh, wider instead of taller, and the lines on it were thicker. And so it was like a child's notebook. And we would get letters in the mail on paper like that, usually written in crayon and kind of sloppy and some words were misspelled. And so we just assumed that it was kids writing to us. But I realized when I became an adult that it wouldn't have been kids. That would have been adults writing to us, making us think it was kids. Is what kid is going to have access to the big amount of money that it takes to buy these films? What kid could afford to buy this? And then also would have the wherewithal to write a letter back to us and say what they want to see in a movie. So I'm, I'm doing this stuff. I'm almost 13 years old. And this older kid runs up to me and says, you know, you're in a satanic coven, right? And he takes off running. I just laughed it off. But after a couple of weeks, I was like, I've seen a couple of older adults at night at sleepovers dressed in black robes. And I ask them, hey, why are you wearing that? And they just laugh it off and walk away. And I started thinking about that kid talking about it as a satanic coven. You know, and... You know, in satanic movies, creepy music plays when the bad guy's on the screen. You know, in the early Batman show, Adam West, when Batman was on the screen, the screen was always upright because Batman is upright and just. But when the bad guy's on the screen, when the Joker, the Riddler, uh, the Penguin, the Catwoman, when they're on the screen, the screen is crooked because they're crooked. They're bad people, you know, and when I'm at this place, you know, I, I can eat whatever I want. I can go to bed whenever I want. I can take drugs. I can drink alcohol. I can have sex. You know, I can do anything I want, anytime I want. And literally, these aren't the bad guys. But we were taught by the Baptist church that Jesus defeated the devil on the cross 2,000 years ago. And Satan is no threat to us. Also, Satan is afraid of the Baptist church. Well, if Satan's afraid of the Baptist church and I'm Baptist, then Satan's afraid of me. Maybe Satan's giving me everything I want because he's afraid of me. So that's putting yourself higher again in your own mind, isn't it? Well, I'm 12. Yeah, yeah. I'm 12 and apparently I'm an idiot. So. As um, I woke up to another, you know, coven member that I know, but I don't know this is truly a coven. And I said, hey, you're going to laugh. I heard this was a satanic coven. Crazy, right? And I'm expecting him to burst out laughing. And instead he says, it is. And my heart dropped into my stomach and I was like, uh, am, am I a member? No, would you like to be? You know, people at my talks ask me, didn't you know right from wrong? Well, yeah, I knew right from wrong, but I also knew that everything I was doing, my parents would have condemned me for. I'm having a great time. You know, I know right from wrong, but I need a paper towel. Um, you know, I know right from wrong, but I know that I'm addicted to porn. I love looking at porn. 
You got to be 18 to buy porn. I'm 12. I love smoking cigarettes, cigars, and pipes. I love tobacco in general. You got to be 19 to buy tobacco products. I'm still 12. And I'm close to being an alcoholic. I get drunk sometimes every day. By the time I get to school, I'm drunk. Sometimes on the weekends, I'm drunk. You got to be 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. I get all my illegal drugs here. If I quit here, I'm not going to have access to my illegal drugs anymore. And I'm having sex almost every day, definitely on the weekend, and during the summer, the entire summer, every day. And I'm starring in porno films. If I quit these guys, all that's going to go away. Those are all my privileges. All that goes away. I can't say no to this. I can't walk away from this. I'm addicted to everything they've got me involved in. I'm taking drugs every day. I'm drinking alcohol every day, trying to have sex every day. I'm being in movies all the time. I feel like I'm important in this group. Anything I want, I can have. Anytime I want it. Satan's afraid of me. And he was defeated anyway 2,000 years ago. So how can these guys be the bad guy? I was like, what do I have to do to join? He said, there's 13 steps to joining a satanic coven, and you've done almost all of them already. All you have left to do, you have to slice your left thumb, left because it's closest to your heart, and you have to bleed onto a document the five-page document, and you have to sign the document in three places in your own blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. And I sign my name to that. Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And I sign my name to that. On the final page of the five-page document, I agree to sell my soul to the devil, and I agree that I'll never go to God even if I could, even if I wanted to. I can't go to God. And I sign my name to that. And so then the next day, after I've done that, then we have a big coven meeting. Um, I show up in a white robe. It signifies I'm losing my innocence. And they baptize me in a demon's head cauldron that they use for baptizing. And they fully submerge you in a vat of human blood, pig's blood, and human urine. They bring you up. You go into another room and take a shower. Come back out in a black robe with a cow raised. Sit in a chair. And they hand you a wheel with a crucifix in it. And you spin the crucifix upside down, signifying human sacrifice. And then you break the arms downward on Christ, denouncing Christ. They show the document you signed the night before in your own blood. You show them your thumb so you can show that it was your thumb you sliced into. And um, then you have a celebration that you're now a Satanist. The reality, though, is that you're celebrating one day you're going to die and go to hell. And then most people get awarded black robe with the red inverted pentagram. But I was addicted to magic, so I was given the red robe with a black inverted pentagram. And that made me the official mage. I was one of the mages in the coven. So I was one of the people that did official magic. When I was 14 years old, I participated in an orgy with all the male members, 12 to 15. And we had sex with a 19-year-old girl who's called a breeder. And she intentionally gets pregnant as many times as she can. Which I think this was her second or third pregnancy. And she gets impregnated on purpose so that she can give have an abortion. 
and eventually she'll get a higher status in the coven or her vote will count as two votes instead of one. And there'll be different things that she qualifies for because she'll have a certain number of abortions under her belt. So at this point, this is her second or third one. And she gets pregnant. And nine months later, approximately, we do a late-term abortion for her. And although this abortion was pretty horrific, it is not the only one that was horrific in my time as a Satanist. Mm-hmm. I've seen probably 20 of them that were like this. Uh, cannibalism took place. It was an, a late-term abortion, and cannibalism took place at the end of it. I figured I would save your audience the details of how disgusting it could get. Yeah, I know if you've mentioned in other uh, interviews, and for the couple only that I've watched that came up, um, because cause right now with like the subject of abortion, obviously it's either you're pro-life or you're pro-choice, which I would say like many pro-lifers, you know, pro-choice means you're, you're, you're pro-death at the end of the day, you're, you're still okay with that. The pro-life is we just want the life. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe it's it's a child of God and all that. So in the world today with this big divide, of, I mean, like, for example, I don't know if you saw the news over in America, but here in the UK just a week or so ago, there was a student, a university campus, I think it might have been Manchester in England, uh, pro-life students gathered for a private group. I don't know what was happening, if they were praying or did a guest speaker. It was organised with the pro-life group themselves, privately. And upon leaving the meeting at the university, I think it was, this just crowd of pandemonium just started attacking them, shouting and cursing and swearing because it was a pro-life meeting. And it's like, are many people just angry because they see it as against women's rights, as the the other side say? Are we talking the fact that amongst amongst them might be doing the same things that you've experienced in your former life, shall we say? um, A lot of exorcists in the United States say that a lot of women that have had abortions are now possessed. Right. So when they go out and they're facing the pro-life people, they're angry. Their demons are angry. You know, their demons don't want you to be protesting what they're doing. You know, or you have demonic attachment because you've been doing abortion mill. And when you say abortion mill, is that what I would just say abortion clinic? Well, because a clinic should be helping you. Right. A clinic is a medical facility that helps you do something positive. And abortion is not positive. I told, I was in a talk in Ireland and at uh, Eddie Stone's. And um, Eddie, yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. The man, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> there was this. Um, woman that said that she just heard of spiritual warfare and she decided to join the fight. I congratulated her and I asked her how old she was. And she said she was 40. And I said, well, congratulations. You've been in the fight for 40 years and nine months. Congratulations of finally finding that out. Deciding to fight back. And people laughed at her in the, in the talk and I said, you guys got no right to laugh. As that I can tell you from being a victim of bullying when I was growing up, that not hitting the bully back will not stop him from hitting you. You were all being attacked. When, from the moment Satan knew your mom was pregnant, till now, until you die, Satan's attacking you. As like, if you guys are here, you're within the sound of my voice, you can hear this talk. When you get home, you should call your local flower shop and ask for flowers to be delivered to your mom. And in the note, just say, thank you for allowing me to be born. Mm-hmm. 
And then I got a call from one of the women over there, the mother. It was like two weeks later. She called and she said that eight of her kids were at my talk. And all eight of her kids bought her a bouquet of flowers each and had them all delivered. She goes, I got eight bouquets of roses that day. <laughs> and I'm like, what, did, did I die and somebody not tell me? It was like, what happened? Why am I getting eight bouquets of roses? And all the notes said the same thing. Thank you for allowing me to be born. And one of them put your business card in the flowers. And when I asked him about it, he said that you're the one that suggested it. So she called to find out why were they, were they sending her flowers? You know, and I mentioned, you know, Roe versus Wade uh, in the States. And then, you know, abortion being legal, you could have aborted them and you chose not to. Yeah. For sure. That was a lovely, lovely story, that. Um, yeah, well, I know you've came to Ireland. You were telling me before we started the recording, maybe we can touch back on that. But again, right, we're saying the clinic is obviously a medical place. You go as a positive way to get made better, but you call it abortion mills. It's still going into a, a clinical environment with a proper doctor and all that, but somehow... Like you or your coven members seem to be allowed there as well. Is it like just networking and the doctors involved, the nurses? I mean, how does it come about where it's, you're all allowed to be there for that to happen? In the United States, every abortion mill that I ever worked at as a Satanist, there was a Satanist there. There was a Satanic coven member may not be in my coven, but it'd be in somebody's coven, and they would be Satan-friendly. So all we had to do was contact them, and we had a, we were well-networked, so we knew that at this coven, at this abortion mill, the security guard is a Satanist. At this other abortion mill, the social worker is a Satanist. At this other abortion mill, the owner of the abortion mill is a Satanist. So. Sometimes it's the doctor, sometimes a nurse. It's never the same person usually, but somebody there is a Satanist and will allow us to do these things. And usually the girl is one of our girls. You know, she goes in to volunteer to have one of her babies killed, but sometimes we can't get one of her own girls. And there's a regular girl going in there, just somebody off the street. And we would offer them, like, we'll give you $1,000 if you let us do a magic spell while you're getting your abortion. They don't care. Uh, they're happy to get our 1000 bucks. I mean, they were about to go in there and pay for the abortion. Now they're getting their money back. Mm. And you're just witnessing the doctor doing it? Right. But my job as the high wizard or as the mage was to get blood on my hands. Now I can get that from the baby or from the mother. And once I've got the blood on my hands, I go do my magic spell. You think it's the one way to say then, like the number one recruiter for Satanists would probably be abortion mills? When I did my first abortion, my first assisted abortion, I thought this is the way to go. I should become an abortion doctor and then I could do as many of these as I could handle and consecrate all of them to Satan. I'd be the richest man in the world because, you know, remember that I was doing my magic spells for money. In my third one, I did the magic spell halfway through and I stopped it and did the Bloody Mary chant. The face showed up and I made sure it knew I was doing a spell for money. And the next day I found a thousand dollars. I found ten one hundred dollar bills. That's one hundred thousand pieces of candy. That's a major score. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was flush with whatever I wanted for almost the next year. 
you know, I, I didn't just buy candy. I bought stuff. You know, so I bought albums, I bought clothes, and I bought pretty much whatever I wanted. My parents would let me go to Goodwill. It's a discounted store. And they didn't check to see what I bought. I had a walk-in closet that's bigger than some people's bedrooms. So I would go to the fill my walk-in closet. My parents never looked in it. I had more shoes than most women, you know, and my parents never checked. They'd see me walk out the door with clothes and think that I must have bought that at Goodwill. But they wouldn't know. They didn't check. You know, they never checked. And they never asked for receipts. And they never saw what I bought. They would just see me walk out the door wearing an outfit. You know, and you get this at Goodwill? Yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking earlier when you were saying, like, you know, where you were hanging about all the time, the illegal drugs, the smoking, the drunkenness. I mean... How did any symptoms not come about where, like, family or members of the church didn't catch on? I mean, you really went under the radar, didn't you? <laughs> well, the deacons of my church came to my coven all the time. Right, right. The, my parents knew everybody that was at my coven. They thought they were all okay. They weren't judging these people as being anything bad because I never appeared to do anything bad. You know, I made, for the most part, I was an A-B student in school. So my mom would give me a large glass of orange juice when I would leave for school in the morning. And then I would walk to school, but I'd walk past one of my friend's houses He'd invite me in and fill the rest of my cup up with vodka. So I'm drinking a big screwdriver on the way to school. By the time I got to school, usually the glass was about empty. It was a cup, so I'd just throw it, throw it in the trash. But sometimes I haven't finished it yet. And the teachers would look at it, see OJ, and just put the lid back on it and send me to class. So I'm drinking OJ in the morning. In reality, I'm drinking a 24-ounce screwdriver. You know, so I come to class, finish it, throw the cup away, and now I'm drunk. And I'm going to be drunk for the next two or three hours. But they know that I haven't drank anything. I couldn't possibly be drunk. Maybe I'm sick. So they might send me to the nurse. He's not acting right. You know, he acts like he's got a fever or something. Right. So can we pick up then from the High Wizard? Obviously you've told us the main things that are happening, you know, the lifestyle, the abortion mills, and here you are as High Wizard. Now, like you say, you're right up there at the top end. There's nothing higher, no one higher, and like the whole right. planet within this this world. Well, well, there's a CEO and a board of directors. They're oh, higher than yeah. Okay. And you come in when it comes to the split decision. Right. But um, the high wizard is hired by whoever wants to hire my coven to do magic. There's between two and five of us in the world, generally, but that number could be as low as one or as high as ten. But generally speaking, is between two and five. And we travel the world doing magic spells for whoever wants them. And they have to negotiate with the Illuminati on what the price is. The most money we were paid for a spell was a billion dollars. A billion, capital B? Capital B. Uh, I wasn't, I don't see that cash. If I get something out of a magic spell, it's that I was given a gift from somebody. Such as. I had a guy that was trying, he owned a really big luxury car dealership. It was really big, and he sold Land Rover, Porsche, and Mercedes. And really top end of all of these. And I did a, he wanted to buy this other guy's dealership. And this guy refused to sell. So 
so in our and what we do stats are kept for all of our magic as the high wizard for a spell to come true and you to get credit for it it has to take place in 90 days so if i do a spell for you for example to get a million dollars you have to get that million dollars by day 90 if you get it on day 91 you're happy as a clam because you got a million dollars but it counted against my stats because it didn't happen in the first 90 days. So I don't get credit for having it come true unless it's a spell for something in the future. And most people that ask for something in the future are not specific. They're like, I just want it to happen. I don't care how long it takes. If I do that spell, I automatically get credit for it coming true. And that I, I love doing spells like that because that would mean that I automatically get credit for it as soon as I do it. And it doesn't go against my stats. It doesn't hurt my stats in any way. So a billionaire at Bohemian Grove in the States out in California asked me to make, he wanted homosexual characters on every TV show no matter what it was, and they wanted that gay character to be the funniest, the wittiest, the smartest, the most handsome, the prettiest, the best dressed, the best lines, and to win all the Emmys. And I'm thinking, this I did this spell in the late 80s. Being gay was not in vogue. Mm. And if you came out of the closet at that time, you were probably beat to death. And I didn't think that would ever come true. But I thought, I'll do the spell for it. So for that spell, my coven was paid $1 billion. And I did the spell, not thinking it would ever work. But I don't know if you're familiar with American television, but can you name a show that doesn't have a gay character? We even have cartoons over here that have gay characters. Yeah, I mean, I think you're one step further than us, although we're on the same path as you here in the UK, and I dare say the Western world, uh, with all the rights changed, and yeah, a lot on TV as well. And if it's not gay characters, they're now bringing in the trans characters and things like that. I've seen it in a couple of shows, even three years ago, maybe I first noticed it. But then you start seeing the repeat, and you just get fed up with it all everywhere you look. But... um. So you just say from that happening in the late 80s, it's finally happened now. But I dare say those that are still active in it, they might still be doing that same type of spell for the same purpose. Or is it just done once and that's it? It's usually just done once. It just it continues. Right. Yeah, it doesn't end unless somebody does a spell to, to end that spell. So the guy with the um, the guy with the luxury car dealership, I did a spell that that guy would sell his property, but would sell his dealership. Well, within the 90 days, he died. The guy who shop they were trying to buy, that guy died. And his wife was like, I don't know why he wouldn't sell to you. I'll sell to you. You buy the inventory, I'll let you have everything else. So... Uh, they bought all the inventory, and that guy had lane, Range Rovers, uh, Land Cruisers, Mercedes, and Porsche. And he asked me, what would I like to have? Anything. He'll buy me. He'll give me any vehicle I want, and they'll also pay for the insurance on it for the first year. So I took a Land Rover. That has a, um, it's called a snorkel. It goes up the side of the outside mm -hmm. and it's from the engine so that your engine can still breathe if it's underwater. So if you're driving through a river or something and your, your engine doesn't get flooded, it can still breathe with the snorkel. And I had bulletproof windows 
and had a bomb-proof chassis. So, which just means it has like quarter-inch steel that is incredibly heavy. And I just got it because it was fun. And it's free. Why not? And um, that was fun. Limo tinted windows, bulletproof glass, armor plated vehicle. Felt safe all the time. And um, and then uh, larger than normal tires. And it has four wheel drive. It's a big SUV with uh, armor plating and waterproof as well, because you can drive through water. And even if it covers my hood, I'm still covered because I've got the mm. the scuba thing up next to it. And um, the snorkel, it was a lot of fun. And that was like an example of a free gift. I got that because the guy died and he was able to buy the luxury car dealership. I mean, it still cost him a few million dollars to buy it because he bought all the inventory. Mm -hmm. But once he had the inventory, he also owned the dealership. Right. He was happy. You know, it's like, but I don't get paid. You know, I got, there was a guy that owned a pinball machine company that had like thousands of pinball machines, thousands of video games. And he was doing a deal or another, he was trying to take over another uh, pinball company. And he took over their company, it was successful. And he asked me what I wanted. And I said, there's a Conan the Barbarian pinball machine. I don't know who makes it, but I know that the pinball inside, instead of being like a regular sized pinball, it's the size of a bowling ball. And it's a giant size game. I'd like to have that. So he gave me that. He had one. And that was that was my my fee for for doing that. Because I don't I normally don't get paid. You know, it's it's not a, a paid position. So, you know, if you can get something, then you try and get something. Right. You know, I had this giant pinball machine in my house. And it was like say the back of it was probably close to 10 feet tall and the glass where you played was about four feet wide it was wider than what you could comfortably play it with paddles you had to have the paddles the buttons for the paddles were moved to a device on like the front of the game but they were smaller closer together so you could easily reach them and it was very much fun playing with a pinball machine that has the ball the size of a bowling ball. Yeah. I mean, I know you could probably give us hundreds and hundreds of stories like that. Maybe just for this little bit, we can, we can maybe stick with that idea of stories. Cause I know you've brought up a couple of those interviews that I watched as well. I'm just trying to grasp the idea that, I mean, you're, you're this high wizard. Everyone wants to seek out for the spells and stuff for fame and fortune and success. I, I help make rock stars. Yeah, well, maybe get a couple of those stories, but I was just thinking, why did you never do that for yourself? Were you just happy being the wizard, the magic guy? Um, I was addicted to magic. I, I wanted to do magic. Right. And I wizard meant that I, I had to do magic. You know, I had to do magic spells every day. You know, it's just like the priest has to do a mass at least one a day. Some priests over here have to do two a day. You know, and if I could do two magic spells a day, that would be perfect. You know, it's like I love ma doing magic. Um, doing it for myself, I mean, I did it for myself when I first started. I got a thousand bucks. Um, you know, I, I would get success as far as I'm giving a new Land Rover, I'm giving a pinball machine. Um, some people would give me a tip, and usually a tip is a few thousand dollars for you know doing something for them. But it, I don't know; it didn't feel right. To, you know what? It's what spell are you doing today? I'm doing a spell for a million dollars for myself. It just 
didn't seem right. And I knew that to do a spell that you wanted to be successful, if you wanted a guarantee that it was successful, you have to do an abortion with it. And I thought I would reserve those for people that are paying us big money to have the spell done. Right. I didn't want to murder a baby for myself. Okay. You did, mate. Well, that kind of answers it then. Obviously, you were keeping those for the big ones because it was the magic that you were addicted to. That was your thing. Because right. I, did, I did have a question there, actually. Like, do these spells work for anyone guaranteed? Is it guaranteed that... And then you did explain the 90 days and things like that with the stats. So I think you've covered that one, unless you've got more to add to it. Um, but you did mention about you created some rock stars. Yes. Uh, I know um, you mentioned uh, some celebrities and things before, but maybe we'll tap on that then. So w what could you tell us about that? All right. So we do what's called a warehouse deal. I meet in either Los Angeles warehouse district or Hollywood warehouse district. And I go to a warehouse. I have an entourage with me. We get there in a limousine and I'm dressed as the high wizard. Did my wife send you the, Pictures of the High Wizard? Mm, no, not the last I checked the emails. Uh, can you send them thing now? Yeah. Just so we can see. Which one? Send them the one with, um, yeah, with pink on the red carpet. Okay. Uh, I remember you touched on that one. So we have a picture of pink standing on the red carpet with the High Wizard. And we're gonna, she's going to send you that now. So I would be dressed as the High Wizard. So if you look up the artist Pink on YouTube and look up uh, the official video of Like a Bill, she has a High Wizard in her video that appears four times. The third and fourth time he appears, he's doing a magic spell. Um, so I go like that to this warehouse. Now, these people that are in the warehouse know why they're there. They know that there's somebody there that can most likely make them famous. But they don't know who it is, and they don't know exactly what to expect. But they've been told by their director, their producer, their publicist, uh, their agent. Somebody within there that knows them has told them, this is where you go to get famous. Mm -hmm. You know, agree to do anything, and you'll become a rock star. Which are the basic rules. If you say you'll do anything, and I ask you some questions, so I go into the, the room, and there'll be, there's booths in there that are closed off so no one can see who's behind it. And then there's other areas, big open areas, where there's just people milling around. Some people set up all their band equipment. I don't need to hear it. I don't need to hear you as a band. All, I just want to know who wants to be famous. And everybody raises their hand. Now, I have a person next to me that has a clipboard that's got everybody's name of who's supposed to be there. And let's say you say, I, I don't want to do those things. Then your name is taken off the list. And we tell you, come back in 90 days. Try again. Now, if you refuse to do something three times in a row, you're banned for probably two or three years. Because you're not famous, you're not serious about becoming famous. Come back in three years when you're hungry. Maybe you'll say that, yes then. And then I know I'm not going to see that person for three years. And then when I see them next time, if they say no again, they're taken off the list permanently and they'll never be a rock star. However, I go up to people and I ask, who wants to be famous? Everybody puts their hand up. The initial question, everybody wants to be famous. In, in a room, if you're standing there and I ask, you want to be famous? If you're in the rock star mentality, yes, you do. You want to be famous. What are you willing to do to be famous? Most people say, I would do anything. However, 
everybody that says that also has a line in the sand that they draw. Because when I come up to you and say, when you say you do anything, what do you mean by anything? And then most people would say, well, nothing with animals or children, but anything else. Well, Satan doesn't want that person. So I have them X'd off the list and I go to the next person. What do you mean by famous? What do you mean by anything? Well, nothing with children. They're X'd off the list. You know, go up to the next person. Nothing with animals. They're X'd off the list. And I keep going down the list until that group of eight people is eliminated. And I go up to another eight people. What are you guys willing to do? Who wants to be famous? What are you willing to do? You know, and it just keeps going through that same process. I've been there for three hours and eliminated probably 300 people that were not willing to do anything. Like they were willing to do everything but one thing. Mm. That's not what Satan wants. Satan wants the person that wants to jump in the mud and be drugged through it. If you're willing to do absolutely anything, I had a guy there by his own admission. He cannot sing. He cannot dance. Now, he wants to be in a successful boy band. This is the 1990s. He wants to be in a successful boy band, and he wants to sing and dance, but he can't do either one. He can't sing, and he can't dance. He doesn't have any rhythm. He doesn't have a good voice. He can't write songs. He can't write poetry. He can't write music. Somebody had left, and I've seen the book there before. Somebody had left a Dr. Seuss book. If you're familiar with Dr. Seuss, everything rhymes. Um, it's like children's poetry books. Okay. It's like, I, I, I would not eat green eggs and ham. I will not eat them, Sam, I am. So I bring him that book, and I said, read me that. So he starts reading it, and it's one of those that, uh, this line and this line will finally rhyme with this page. So he reads this one and this one. The next line would be rhyming, and he closes the book and says, I don't get it. Okay. So he can't even make a Dr. Seuss book rhyme. But I said, what are you willing to do to be famous? He said, I'll do anything. I was like, name anything. Because everybody at this point is like, well, I wouldn't do anything with this or this. He tells me, if you put me in a room with a three-year-old girl and a horse, I'm having sex with at least one of them. You're our boy. Yeah. Like, it's called a tier two card. Just a white card with a black phone number on it. I said, you call this number, do whatever they tell you to do, and I'll see you on MTV in six months, singing and dancing. So he takes the card. And I think it was less than six months. I'm looking at MTV, and there's this new band that's out. It's in sync. And he's in the band. And he's singing and dancing. And he's got rhythm all of a sudden. And he can actually sing. And I thought, huh, I wonder what he did. I wonder if they put him in a room with a three-year-old girl and a horse. So that wasn't you doing the spell for him. You took him to associate. Well, you gave him the number for associates to do it. What he does, he goes to a hotel in Los Angeles. You go in and you tell them at the front desk your name. And that you call this number, what do I do now? The front desk will give you a key to a room. And they'll write a code on it. And then you sit down and they'll get a call down on the, in the lobby. And it'll be for you. And you have to come up to a certain room. Uh, you swipe the key and the door opens up. When you walk into the room, there'll be a, a large wooden table there usually white, and it has, um, I don't know what they're called, it's a bowl made of glass, and has a stand on it, and it's like this big, and it has a bunch of white cards in it. 
and you don't have to take what's on top. You can dig around through it and find one, but you're not allowed to open it until you've pulled it out. Once you pull it out, because it's sealed, you open it up and you read what it says and you hold it up to the camera so the camera can see what it says. And now you either choose what that one says, or if that's not to your liking, you dig your hand back in there and you find something else. Just remember that that may not be the only time what you've got is in there and that what you've got may be the lesser of the two choices. Once you get the second thing out, you've got to do that one. You can't go with the one you had in your hand. So make sure that you cannot live with yourself if you did this because that one might be worse. And this is the thing he has to do when it comes to things he has to do. Now, if he decides I'm not going to do either one of these and he walks out the door, he also is not allowed to come back for a year. You know, he gets that year to think about was it worth it to walk out? You could have been famous. You could have been rock star famous right now, but you chose not to. You know, so. Yeah. What, what people don't understand is that every rock star out there, it, I made rock stars. If you look at somebody that was famous between 87 and 99, I signed them. Now, if you were famous prior to 87, you signed with a different eye wizard. Mm. Famous after 87 or after 99, it was another high wizard. But if you were famous during that time, if you got famous during that time, I'm the one that signed you. And all those people that were signed have to do something like that. And something like that is having sex with animals or having sex with children. When here in the States, we had these two rock stars, one named Chester Bennington. He was with Lincoln Park and Chris Cornell. He was with Soundgarden and with um, Audio Slave. And both of these guys were going to break the industry wide open and admit to all the sexual deviancy and the pedophilia within the rock industry and confess to everything that happens and, and name names and tell who it was that's done what with who and what children have been abused and how many that they know of and what rock stars had to sleep with who to become a rock star. And then as a result, they were what's called in the United States, we have a term called being suicided out. It means they were, they were suicided out, but it means they were murdered. Right. They didn't commit suicide. They committed suicide within days of each other. Both men, I think, were on tour and both had a lot to live for for the next, you know, they're on tour for like the next 90 days. So they've got stuff they're planned to do for the next 90 days, and yet they kill themselves? I don't so think so. Was it a spell for them to do it to themselves? They literally were taken out with someone else? I think they were actually physically taken out by somebody else. Right. And, you know, they, they were both going to, they were both saying that they were going to reveal and name names and talk about the pedophile scandal within the rock and roll industry. And then they both turn up dead. You know, so who's going to confess to it now? Because people see that two big name rock stars were murdered and no one found out the truth. So they don't want to be next. Yeah, true. I mean, you dropped a couple of names. I mean, I'm not wanting to question you all night about names and who's done it, but I mean, the one thing I'm picking up, though, like how they all gather in the area, you turn up, you 
you sift through them all and who goes to the hotel, it's the front desk, it's the guy in the camera, it's their agents and their, their co whoever's telling them where to go in the first place. I mean, this is completely infiltrated in society. This is saturated with this network of how this all comes about. Right. I mean, this isn't just a few little people in a little area in the world. I mean, this is this is everywhere, isn't it? It's nothing to be shunned or, or think oh, that's a load of taboo or that's not real. I mean, this is reality, isn't it? Right. And, you know, when Taylor Swift came out, um, I told everyone that would listen, you know, because everybody was like, well, surely Taylor Swift isn't involved in all this. It's like, listen, if Taylor Swift is famous, she's involved. And she's eventually going to do the same thing that Britney Spears did and the same thing that Miley Cyrus did. She's going to come out and look all innocent and cutesy. And then her dark side is going to come out and she's going to be doing witchcraft spells on stage. And they're like, oh, no, not Taylor Swift. She's nice and innocent. She's a Christian girl. I was like, so was Britney Spears and so was Miley Cyrus. You know, she's going to go the same way. You know, so everybody, you know, said no to me that she's never going to do that. Well, now, uh, Father Vigil, an exorcist in the States, said that no one can go see Taylor Swift because she's attracting demons with her shows because in her shows, she does full-on magic witchcraft spells. You know, she dates the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, and she admits that she does magic spells for her husband's football team. Right. So would you take for granted, then, that she's been to these meetings, or the likelihood, at least, if you don't know for certain, but you could put your money on it that these celebrities that you've mentioned, even Miley Cyrus, Pink, uh, well, Britney Spears, you could put your money on and take a bet to say they've done this thing that I've just described about these rock stars and things. Do well, you, do Britney Spears would have signed her deal when she was a child. She was, she was on Disney Channel. Oh, my she, uh, Britney. Oh, Britney, sorry, right. I was never much of a fan of them, to be honest with you, but I know who they are. But would you say that some people can still make it to fame and fortune through hard work and talent? Uh, I mean, are you expecting anyone well, amongst the industry right now to be authentic rather than going down this way? When I was a high wizard, they would know where we're going to be 90 days in advance. So every 90 days, we're given a list of rock stars that are going to be where we are that we're allowed to go see for free. And if we're allowed to see them for free, it means they've signed with us. Mm. And maybe not with me, but with somebody else. There were certain bands that I liked to go see, but I had to pay to go see them. And if I had to pay to go see them, they didn't make it through us. Mm. And the bands that I knew that didn't go through us was Bruce Springsteen, U2, Pink Floyd, and Metallica. They didn't go through you. They didn't go through us. Because you hear some names, of, but again, I don't. I was never into the, the heavy, dark metal rock or whatever you call it, but see like Black Sabbath, Judas Priest. I mean, you hear their names straight away and you're like, what's going on? Then I, I mean, the furthest I would go to being attracted to some songs, although again, I'm, I'm not heavy into any of it or that at all whatsoever, would be like ACDC, but as soon as I saw a couple of people play them once years ago, and I'm like, a couple of decent tunes there, having the drums behind me, I'm always tuning into the drummer, he's like, he keeps it simple, he keeps the beat, he doesn't go crazy like Ronnie Top with Elvis, he keeps the right. beat, but the crowd are just giving the devil horn sign, there's devil stuff everywhere, and I'm like, right, even that, it's like, no go, you just know, but that's this attraction to it all, isn't it? Well, it, it, now it's not just the, uh, you don't just have to know this, you also have to know this. 
Yes, well, see again, this is where I know we're going in, we're staying in this bit for a little while, which isn't planned, but I think we're covering some good stuff here, because how many people now turn on social media, there's so much, and is it just someone making a good video, but it's a wild card, it's conspiracy and all this, but even Celine Dion was getting accused with that, and it was on her clothing brands apparently, but now she's... Um. Retired because of health reasons, and I'm like Celine Dion, really. All these symbols. Jay Z puts quotes from Aleister Crowley on his clothing label, right? Then his wife Beyonce um, says that she gets possessed by Sasha Pierce, as her demon's name, and she gets up on stage. And then Jay Z, when he's in front of a bunch of people. He holds up the diamond logo, which is an Illuminati logo. Right. So there's no doubt in your mind they're all involved then. This is Illuminati. Um, Pink has a high wizard in her video who apparently she personally knows. Lupe. Yes. Did you send it to him? I did. Okay. So my wife sent you the picture of the high wizard standing in an email standing next to pink on the red carpet. So, I mean, apparently it's somebody she personally knows, but she's standing next to him on the red carpet. But with you being out of that circle for so long, you wouldn't know who he is now. No, I wouldn't know. You did mention in the last interview, the first interview I ever watched with you just a week ago, when you said that story about the singer, Six months later, you saw him on MTV. You couldn't remember if it was NSYNC or Backstreet Boys, but tonight you've says NSYNC. Are you definitely sure? Why she said it was NSYNC. But you've obviously made it public. You're not worried about sharing things like that public. Um, some people, you know, it, it depends on who I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, we used to have an attorney for the ministry, and he had said that I can't share... If, if a rock star has made a statement themselves, you can share that story. But I can't say a story about them, even if I was there. If I'm the one that gave them the card and they went to become a rock star based on me giving them something, it's my word against theirs. And I could be sued because I can't prove that they did it. You know, my proof is that they're famous. You know, they can say, hey, I made it here through hard work. Mm. Who am I to say that that's not how they got there? And then the same thing could be asked of you. Well, what do you gain by telling these stories and making it up? There's nothing to gain. Right, there's nothing to gain. Uh, you, you spoke to Father Leo about how you, at the interview I saw, you gave up the High Wizard place and the coven and, and you moved away. But you were still doing magic. Well, I was still, I was addicted to magic, but I wanted out of my coven, so I plotted an escape for for eight months. And you know, when one of the reasons that I left is that when I first joined as the High Wizard, when I became the High Wizard, I got to do magic. Now I have to do magic. I used to get to travel. Now I have to travel. I used to get to party with rock stars. Now I have to party with rock stars. I used to get to go to actors' parties. Now I have to go to actors' parties. I used to get to sleep with hookers and take cocaine if I wanted it. And whatever drug I wanted to do, I could do. Whatever girl I wanted to sleep with, I could sleep with. But because I did it in the beginning, I'm expected to keep that up. So now I have to take drugs and I have to sleep around. And I'm tired of doing this. I don't want to do it anymore. Looking at a beautiful woman after a while, like when you can ask this of anybody that's ever been to a lot of strip clubs, after a while, no girl is pretty enough because you've seen the prettiest women that there are in all these strip clubs. Now, what's something I didn't realize is that the prettiest woman 
is not going to be in a strip club. You know, the prettiest woman is going to be in church looking for you, but she can't find you because you're in the strip club. Mm. You know, I'm in strip clubs and or I'm going to brothels and I'm finding the hottest that I can find and none of them are pretty enough to satisfy me. You know, and I'm just, I'm tired of what I'm looking at. I, I've done 146 assisted abortions. And even though when I do it, I feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof, I'm tired of doing it. You know, and so I, I plotted my escape. Now, I had a, a bank account with $87 million in it. But that's my coven's bank account. It's not mine. Right. My bank account has about $235 in it. But they watch my bank account. So I would have to go to a store, buy some gas, take out an extra 20 bucks. Go to a store, buy a candy bar and a gallon of milk, take out an extra 10 bucks. So I'm pilfering out of my own bank account. $10 here, $20 there. So it doesn't look like I'm taking large sums of money. But if you looked at my bank account over the period of eight months, you'd see that I've taken about $3,000 out. Um, you know, I'm doing the best that I can with what I have. And I plan an escape. The day that I'm going, I'm, I'm paranoid because they watch everything I do. When I'm living around the world, I have a house in Germany, I have a condo in Atlanta, and I have a mansion in Calabasas. My real home is in Tallahassee, Florida, and I live in Frenchtown, which is the ghetto. I don't know if it's still the ghetto, but it was the ghetto back then. So I'm, um, I also, I drive, when I'm in Calabasas, I drive a Lamborghini Diablo. When I'm at my house in Florida, I'm driving a Nissan Sentra. So when I'm dressed as the High Wizard, Armani makes my suit. It's an 18th century style tuxedo. But my, uh, my regular clothes are cut off jeans, a Metallica shirt, and flip flops. So I'm not looking anything like the High Wizard. So I. Plan a doctor's appointment with a satanic doctor. And I have to jump on the interstate and drive to the last exit. But instead of driving to the last exit and getting off, I kept driving. And I, I drove till I ran out of gas. And I parked on the side of the road and I slept overnight. And then the next day, I hitchhiked into town. When I got into town, I sold my car for scrap. I collected a bunch of food that I had with me, put it in a backpack, and I was going to catch a Greyhound to Canada. Now, this was 1999. The 9-11 hadn't happened yet. So you could get into Canada with just a driver's license. So I get up to Canada, and they reject me at the border. And Greyhound says I can go anywhere in the United States I want to go, except Hawaii. I'm like, okay. So I opened up an atlas for the United States, closed my eyes and put my finger down. Let's see where God's telling me I'm going to live. And it said Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right, so I'm going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually ended up going to Broken Arrow, and I lived there for three years. One year off the grid, two years on the grid, bought a car, and drove to Canada and got rejected again at the border. And by now it's 2003. So 9-11 has happened mm -hmm. and got rejected at the border. And I was heading back to Oklahoma and a friend called me, asked me where I was going, what was I doing? And I told him where I was. And he said, Oh, there's a border crossing near Vermont where there's no guard there. Just cross over. You'll be fine. So I did that. 
I was about two hours away from the border crossing, and I was so tired I couldn't keep my eyes open. So I stopped at a rest stop to take a nap, except that when I took my nap, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and when I woke up, it was 7 o'clock in the morning. So I slept all night. Okay, fine. So I get up, go to the bathroom, come back to my car. It's only two hours away. Set my GPS, and I go driving. Two hours later, I cross the border, and I get pulled over by a border guard. This guy searches my car inside and out, top to bottom. And he tells me that he's been trying for three years to get this job. And today is his very first day on the job. And I realized that God's got a sense of humor. Had I driven across the border yesterday, I'd be safely in Canada. But because I took a nap overnight, I'm rejected at the border. I am okay. worth $18 and I have half a tank of gas. So I drive to Burlington, Vermont. It's like the closest city to me and I can't get into Canada. This guy rejected me because I didn't have a passport. And so I drive to Burlington, Vermont. My first day in town, I got a job working at Nectar's in the kitchen as their dishwasher. And it, it enabled me to have a job, have money coming in, but still practice magic every day. And then eventually I became um, the dishwashing lead. And then I was put on the door, so I was a doorman. And then I was head of security. And the doorman is basically a bouncer, but they call it a doorman. It sounds nicer. Yeah. Um, but I was head of security and then I got a job working at another bar and I got head, hired as head of security and then they made me the GM for the bar. So we had a daytime GM and a nighttime GM. So I was the nighttime GM. And then from that, I got a job working in the mall in um, retail. So I was the manager of finish line manager in training and then i got hired as general manager at sunglass hut and then i got a job as manager at piercing dakota still practicing magic every day and i did magic one night in piercing dakota and the next day i come in and this woman wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings uh, piercing dakota is a jewelry store and i present her with the perfect pair and she tells me, you know, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. When I'm done, I'll come back and I'll buy these. I said, okay, and I put them to the side. Most people that say that, what they mean is, I'm going to go find it cheaper someplace else. But she had an honest face. I knew she was coming back. And sure enough, three hours later, this woman comes back. We do the transaction. At the end of the transaction, I hand her the receipt. And I say, if you take all, take the receipt, all, all the 800 number on it, take a survey, you might win $1,000. She goes, that's great. I've got something for you, too. And she reaches her hand in her purse. And I'm thinking, oh, no. She's going to pull out a Jack Chick pamphlet, tell me that I'm sinning, and drop to my knees and beg for forgiveness. All this stuff I can't do because I sold my soul to the devil when I was 13. But instead, she pulls out this little gold, cheap-colored piece of tin. That this blessed, miraculous metal is more powerful than I was. She drops in my hand, I clench my fist around it, and my mall and my store completely disappear. I am standing in a darkened void I'm not standing on anything. I'm not on the floor anymore. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, like a grace from the Holy Spirit, I knew that the Blessed Mother was the Mother of God. And as soon as I knew it was the Mother of God, Mary appeared. And she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And she smiled at me. 
and it was a smile I knew I did not deserve. <laughs>